That brings up a, an ethical issue, which goes around like slavery, right? If we already have machines that are conscious, why are we keeping them inside of these basements or inside of these labs and doing experiments on them, right? That sounds, that sounds not moral. Do you think people look at us and think that we're weird? Absolutely, 100%. I've embraced that. That's, that's, that's part of the reason why I am the way that I am on LinkedIn. It's really fast information uh, processing and manipulation at a, at a low level in the computer. And we see the output of that and we project the idea that that thing is conscious. There, there might be organisms or systems that experience even greater conscious experience than we do and there might be systems that will experience lesser version of of this consciousness a lot of us are really living incorrectly i would say in, in the way that we view the world and the way that we treat each other and the way that we treat life in general i feel that money becomes a um, a currency of usefulness if you provide value if you contribute value to the world the, the world rewards you with money uh, consciousness or Cognition is tied to a biological body in some way or form, which we haven't been able to actually figure out the specifics of that. I'm delighted today to be joined by Luis Riera. And uh, Luis, good to have you on the program. Your LinkedIn profile says many things. Uh, I'm going to, uh, you know, take a, take a note of, of each one of them and probably you would help me unpack this, um, uh, this combination of things. So you're, you call yourself an artist, creative technologist, ML engineer, that's machine learning engineer, philosopher, comedian, and then finally human. Could you unpack that for me? Absolutely. Thanks for having me, by the way, Naja. Um, so I've always had this weird concept of not trying to pigeonhole myself into any profession, job title, pretty much, you know, uh, putting a, a category for myself. I felt that was very limiting to the type of person that I wanted to uh, eventually become. So when I went to school, you know, I did mechanical engineering. I studied that type of track. Uh, but when I graduated, I realized I wasn't really passionate about that type of work. I love the math. I love the physics. I love learning. Uh, but I wanted to do something else. So I tried biomedical engineering. And that was also amazing. I, I got to learn more about the, the human body, the physiology, a lot of other things that I had, hadn't learned in just uh, mechanical engineering, uh, but that still wasn't like what I wanted to do. So I, I've explored many areas of the human uh, experience, such as art, philosophy, uh, science, engineering. Um, and throughout that process, I discovered that I just enjoy that process of learning and applying what I learn. Um, so be it music, be it um, any type of activity that I find like entertaining or fascinating, I want to try to become better at that. Um, I've played volleyball, I've played soccer, basketball at pretty decent levels where I could say it's maybe above average. Um, and it's all because I've put in the time and effort um, to get better at those things. Um, so I decided I'm like, you know, I'm all I am all these things. Why not, you know, put that out there in Facebook, uh, Facebook in LinkedIn and have people um, know that it's not just one thing that you need to be in your life. You can be a lot of things if you want to. Yeah, and this is a very personal matter to me as well. <laughs> Let me give you some context. Ma, in, in our family, like uh, we have, like my sister is a uh, pediatrician. She's studied medicine. She's specialized. My brother is an electric engineer, specialized. The idea of specialization is embedded when, in our family. And what, and then I start growing up and I, Literally, I was always confused and I didn't know what to do. And I started like developing certain skills and then jumping to another. And I always felt myself like this is not appropriate for the society or for the way I was brought up. And then I stumbled on the concept of multipotentiality, multipotentialite, or, you know, um, there's other names for it, like polymath. And then I, I think I felt that um, it hits home a little bit because um, I also feel that I cannot be confined. But yet again, the marketplace keeps pushing you to be specialized. Like even if you want to, uh, I remember at some point I had on my LinkedIn similar to what you had in your bio, like I had multiple things. But then, as I said, like the marketplace 
keeps wanting you to define yourself in a very specific thing for a very specific niche and you know and and sometimes we're thinking about whether whether we want to be who we are or whether whether we want to fit in what the marketplace wants so i don't know if you struggle with this stuff <laughs> yeah tell me about it man it's 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 hard it's difficult because like you say people want a specific type of person that's had just that specific knowledge and skill um but i've tried that and i've gotten really good at at um software engineering and like machine learning i've i've gotten really deep into those skills and i've been able to produce like you know products and applications uh that help other people but it it didn't feel like fulfilling to me especially because i didn't believe in the products and the vision of the of the companies um that i worked for so um i started to actually feel physically ill because uh i i followed that specialization path and i just kept quiet i didn't express myself i didn't let out whatever it was that i was feeling um so i i really got physically ill and it was last year that this happened to me i had uh, gastrointestinal issues and it got to the point where i really i thought i had cancer i thought i was getting cancer because i you know bathroom stuff uh just waking up with with very bad symptoms of bloating and all that crap uh so i i'm like okay this is not good for me what's what's the cause of my issues is it is it my diet is it my stress levels etc cetera, etc cetera. so i started really honing in on where it was coming from and i figured that it was literally from me uh just bottling everything up and not being my authentic self um so that's when i started uh not caring anymore about the specializations not caring anymore about you know working for other people's visions that i don't agree with Um and that's been my journey for now and I'm feeling a thousand times better in my in my health in my my mind uh and I'm more clear now more than ever where I want to go. So we connected on LinkedIn and I am fascinated by you know the posts that you publish the depth of these posts and if I can block your profile picture and only judge your age by the reading of these posts i would think that you're like a 70 80 years old philosopher <laughs> so can i i'm curious how old are you um i just turned 35 that's incredible incredible because the amount of depth in your posts like i've been looking into and this is basically the topic of what we're going to be talking about today and this is how we actually connected via via these posts that you publish and i think we we share a lot of interest in these in these topics and these ideas um so uh just to dive in with uh the the main theme of our talk today which is machine consciousness first of all tell me your um your background when it comes to these llms have you have you seen them before chatgpt was released or chatgpt was the first time you actually experience them great question um i i definitely had uh heard of transformers before chat gpt came out which is the architecture that it's built on um but i i was more of a computer vision specialist i was more doing things with cameras uh, video images and uh that type of data so text i i did natural language processing and i knew my way around how to like uh you know do all the technical stuff in there but um yeah i i, I wasn't specifically uh diving down into the LLM path I had more a computer vision focused area right and once what was your first impression when chatgpt was released the first question i asked it was are you conscious um that was my first question to go to <laughs> so do you think and then i had it a back and forth and eventually obviously right I now determined that it wasn't um so yeah that's that's kind of what i did the first thing and then obviously from there I went online and I just started bashing on it and saying it's not a it's not as it's not what you guys think it is or whatever um so yeah I was the first person probably to start bashing on on ChatGPT the day it came out so you, do you think it is conscious right now I don't have a reason to believe so it's um it's a lot it's really fast information uh processing and manipulation at a at a low level in the computer and we see the output of that and we project the idea that that thing is conscious onto it that's how i believe it's happening currently 
um, because there's many right, arguments aren't we from doing a the same thing as humans? Substrate independence um, point of view, where um, co consciousness or um, cognition is tied to a biological body in some way or form, which we haven't been able to actually figure out the the specifics of that. So to say that we've been able to recreate that inside of silicon, just off of the transformer architecture, that is very very just basic math. Uh, doesn't I don't think doesn't lead to consciousness currently. Why? Because the conscious experience is uh, inexplainable through uh, mechanistic material processes. There's there's no way to go. Then that's the hard problem of consciousness, right? It doesn't matter if we were able to take our brain, simulate it perfectly inside of a computer, atom by atom. Uh, there's no reason why that thing will will. Uh, have consciousness as well. There's no explanation for why it should or shouldn't. So we have no clue. We have no clue of how to create it, why it why it arises. Um, and the systems that we're developing, they have very little to do with with like actual research on consciousness. Have you heard of panpsychism? Absolutely. The, and the idea is that consciousness is a fundamental part of the universe. And it exists in all matter. And if that's the case, then it doesn't necessarily need to need the biological uh, environment to, to flourish in. And, and that also means that s particles and matter of silicon would also become if, uh, if, if need be, um, they, they, there's no, if, if we take panpsychism as a possible theory, uh, then there's no reason to believe why computers cannot be conscious at some point. And note that consciousness is a spectrum. So we might not, we might, we might experience consciousness to a certain level. There, there might be organisms or systems that experience even greater conscious experience than we do. And there might be systems that will experience lesser version of, of this consciousness. Yeah, that's, that's a good point. Um, panpsychism would, would state that right now the machine systems that we have are conscious. So if, if you're a panpsychist, then you have to believe that, that the machines right now are conscious. So then that brings up a, an ethical issue, uh, which goes around like slavery, right? If, if we already have machines that are conscious, why are we keeping them inside of these basements or inside of these labs um, and doing experiments on them, right? That sounds, that sounds not moral. Um, so that's why I hope we're not living in a panpsychist universe. I am open to the idea or possibility that maybe we are. Um, but I really hope we're not, because if we are, then we're creating something uh, very ethically and morally uh, iffy, I would say. Uh, that's one point. Another point is how can we how can we empirically prove panpsychism? How how does one grasp grasp at it with experimentation or uh, scientific consensus? That would be another area to like really look into. And the third point about all this is if panpsychism is true, then then a lot of a lot of us are really living incorrectly, I would say, in, in, the, in the way that we view the world and the way that we treat each other and the way that we treat life in general. Um, because that right, it's already mind blowing enough that that the Big Bang is like how things got started, supposedly. Right. According to, to science, that's already a mind blowing thing that that something this crazy, this interesting comes from nothing, just just started from nothing. Right. That's the materialist scientific point of view. That's already mind blowing. It would be even more mind blowing to posit that this whole experience here is part of a, like a conscious overall arching, I don't know, being, whatever you want to call it. So it, it, being a panpsychist doesn't necessarily solve any of our mysteries or any of our problems with this stuff. It, it just states that it's, it's right there for us to, to stare at and we have no idea why it's here. Yeah. So I've had people, guests on the podcast from many different, um, backgrounds and, and beliefs. There is the, those who believe that consciousness arise and are, uh, is an emergent uh, attribute. And there are those who believe that consciousness is foundational in the universe. And I think, you know, 
I I don't have I don't have a clear belief in 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 either of the of those, and that's why I'm, I have this podcast because I ask people questions that I don't know about, and I just listen. But it's very interesting because um, the thing is when I read uh, Conscious, the book Conscious for Annika Harris, I believe I read it right after I read uh, The Feeling of Life Itself by Christoph Koch. And kind of like at, at first I read Christoph Koch's work and I was like, oh my God, integrated information theory, that's it. You know, it's an emergent behavior that if a system become complex enough and have the, the, in, the, the information of, of its, um, it's integrated and you can measure it and it's a scientific approach and whatnot. So I'm like, okay. But then, you know, also like on the other side, panpsychism makes also sense because emergence is hard. It's hard to, um, to understand something that is zero to one. Where, like, if you if you believe it's foundational, it means like there's degrees to it. Like, for example, the organ in your body is it conscious? And if 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 you believe it is, then it has a lesser lesser degree than than your entire self. And maybe you can go all the way to the cell, and mm-hmm. or you can believe well, only brains are conscious. They they experience life. There is something to be like a dog because the dog has a brain. Um, but then, but then, how would you explain that plant that um, you know will will sense and will do behaviors? I don't know if you've seen those experiments on plants and how they. There are people who are studying plant behavior, and it's mind blowing too. I mean, you cannot just say, "Oh, they don't have a brain." I mean, they might. You know, they do stuff that is really amazing. Yeah, that's that's a good point. Um, I, I, I like to think about like, this is my crazy out there idea. Uh, might as well just start throwing it out there. Um, I do think consciousness is all pervasive in the universe somehow, sort of like how, um, physicists describe their quantum fields. So there to me exists a consciousness field pervade, uh, pervasive throughout the entire universe. But I don't think that that means that this stuff here, um, is conscious because of that. It's just a field that exists around um, and certain organisms like humans or, or animals, etc. when their organizational structure becomes a certain way, um, the interaction between that complex system and the field of consciousness creates to me that experience that we have of, of the things that we, we experience. Um, and in that way, it kind of is like sort of panpsychist in a sense, because I do think that, that consciousness is p- pervasive everywhere. But it only gets to the point of subjective experience when there's a complex enough system capable of um, kind of like tuning into that into that field. Um, so now my question would be to, to try to prove that or whatever. We would have to try to figure out the specifics of the field, what kind of uh, particle is behind it. Is there a consciousness particle? Is there et cetera? Like that would be where I would try to investigate this further. I'm curious, how did you get into philosophy? Like, how did you start questioning these things? I was talking to my mom about this the other day, and it's always been a natural uh, instinct of mine to do this. For example, when I was a little kid, I saw a, a, a fly just, you know, flying around the room, and then it landed on the wall. And to my child brain, my question was, I wonder what it feels like to be that fly. You know, like, I wonder what it feels like to be inside of that body and look out through its eyes and like, you know, move around and like get swatted at. And like, like that was my curious brain, just always asking those questions. And I had weird, weird questions. I was like, why is it that I'm just in this body right now? Why wasn't I born in another body? Why wasn't I born in another time? Like I had these crazy questions as a little kid. And as I got older, it never stopped. Those questions never stopped coming up in my head. And I would annoy my high school friends all the time, bringing up, you know, consciousness when we were hanging out, just trying to talk about it for whatever reason. Um, and then when I went into college, that's when I started getting more uh, formal with, with reading like people's ideas about what they had thought previously. Um, and then from there, yeah, I just kind of naturally became what I do. Do you think people look at us and think that we're weird? Absolutely. A hundred percent. I've embraced that. That's, that's, that's part of the reason why I am the way that I am on LinkedIn. 
um, because uh, being weird has been, um, what would I say? It's been alienating for sure, but it's also been like a superpower because it's allowed me to do what I do today, which is be happy with, with everything that I've accomplished. Um, I'm at peace. I'm, you know, I, I see other people that might not be the weird that I am. They might be the normals. But I see them stressed out. I see them worrying about like all these silly things that I don't think we should be worrying about. So if that makes me weird, I'll take it. And you st- you talk a lot about uh, progress in your LinkedIn, and you define it not in materialistic way. However, we live in a capitalistic society, and everything is measured by the numbers. What 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 is your view on this one? Because this is important to me too. Yeah, that's, that's a big one. Um, uh, I remember I had like a small little discussion with my dad when we were growing up and he wanted me to be obviously, cause every parent wants their child to succeed. He wanted to me for me to be a professional and engineer, et cetera, so that I could one day have money, right? That was the main thing, having money. And back in the day, obviously I was very naive. I was very young, but I had a, 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 a counter thought to that. I was like, I, I know money is okay. Money is important. I'm like, but I don't put it at the top. To me, at the top is health, uh, my family, my mental peace. Um, like those immaterial things are actually the first thing for me. Then, okay, money, shelter, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Like we'll figure that out after I have the top stuff set. So that was my, my thinking when I was like 16, 17 with my dad. My dad obviously hated that. He was like, no, you, got, you need money, man. You, you got to go get that money. Um, so I've always had the pressure as, as everybody does to go after the money, but it just has never become something like an ambition or like a, like a, um, I don't know, people get addicted, I think, to just getting more and more money and collecting more and more money because it becomes a, a social game where you compare yourself to others on that metric. Like you said, the numbers, right? And the numbers of my bank account are bigger than this person. So somehow I must be smarter or better or whatever. And I don't see that as the case. Everybody's a human to me. Elon Musk is the same as the, the guy out here, uh, you know, on the street. That's that's how I see people. That's how I see myself. Um, and just, just like that, I don't see myself above anybody. I'm just like everybody else. I feel that money becomes a, um, a currency of usefulness. If you provide value, if you contribute value to the world, the, the world rewards you with money. So a lot of entrepreneurs that I listen to, they equate that with, like if you do things that that people are not willing to pay for, that means that what you're doing is not of value. Do you subscribe to that mentality or no? Absolutely not, I think. Um, I'll give you a few examples where I don't think that that's the case. Um, I think that a lot, of mo- a lot of the stuff that people do for money is exploitation. Exploitation of a fellow human based on the psychology of how humans work. Uh, my main thing right now would be like OnlyFans, right? OnlyFans is based on the psychology of the male gaze uh, and, and how it is attracted to, to shapes, right? So, so shapes have an effect on our mind. It's, it's, not, it's not without meaning. So something round or something pointy or something long, those all have some type of effect on our cognition. And some people either know this consciously or unconsciously. And so they put out these images of them naked, you know, of the, of the shapes that attract the psychology of a person. And that person goes in and provides money for that. Now, that can be done, I don't know, if, if, if <laughs> like, I don't know if I had a kid, I would want them to do that, right? That's one of the main things that I, that I think sometimes. Some people are going to do it, sure. But um, what if the person on the other side is a man and he's pretending to be a woman, with an AI, right? Now you can just create avatars of people. So it's a man, he's pretending to be a woman and he's using that manipulation, that exploitation of the psychology to get resources, get money without providing actual value, I would say. It's, it's just a, an addiction and a psychological uh, manipulation tactic. And that happens not only in the sex parts, but in many other areas of human uh, endeavors. So yeah, I don't think that necessarily the capitalistic economic view that if you provide value, you'll get a lot of money is correct. Some, some people do that, but there's a lot of cases where that's not the case. That is interesting because I think capitalism is manufactured 
from our intellect as a collective uh, society. Uh, in the jungle, uh, there's abundance. So there's nobody's uh, really accumulating wealth in the jungle. Like if you look at animals and stuff, they don't have this kind of um, system. But capi the capitalism served us well in terms of keeping us, um, keeping us, you know, working hard, um, achieving more. You know, you know. I think the whole experience of us working towards a goal, and this goal is has a money has a money value associated with it. You know, keeps us because because the people who are who are pro capitalism and against other forms of systems will tell you that if we loosen capitalism or if we uh, replace it with other forms then people become lazy uh, there there's not going to be any more contributions and then we're going to just go down as a civilization um, but i'm always questioning that too because i believe that it's innate in us to to produce but also you know some other people will will just maybe abuse the system if we have a different system yeah, yeah. The people are always going to look for ways to, to abuse any system. Um, I mean, the current capitalistic system that we have, there's abuse in that as well, right? A lot of people um, cheat on their taxes, get, you know, um, government subsidies or, or handouts, and, and they find ways to cheat. So capitalism isn't free of that. Um, and also, like you said, we have to, to give thanks to the, to the good parts of capitalism, what it has provided us with. Um, so that's always a good thing to keep in mind, even though the, the systems might not be perfect or might not be the best, we have to be appreciative of what it has given us today um, so that we can maybe make a, an effort to make things possibly better or different for tomorrow. Um, you talk about something called lucid dreaming in some of your LinkedIn posts. Do you mind unpack that for me? Yeah, yeah. Have you you ever had a lucid dream? No, I don't know what that is. Interesting. Okay, so this is my experience when I ever whenever I have a dream, um, I feel that it's real. Right? It feels real. It feels like I'm actually there. And if it's a nightmare, it's scary and and I'm frightened, just like I would be right here when I'm awake. But I know it's a dream because when I wake up. I'm now in a different place and I'm in my bed and I'm like, you know, coming out of that sleep. So I'm like, oh, no, that thing that just was happening to me that I thought was real, that was just a dream. So that's that's my usual experience with dreams. And I think that's the normal experience for most people. But for some reason, in some of my dreams, um, I've had this weird ability or whatever you want to call it to, to realize in the dream that I'm dreaming. Right. So it no longer feels like like real because I'm like, this is a dream. I'm dreaming right now. So I realize that in the dream, I become aware of that and then I can manipulate my dream. And what that means is uh, I usually like to fly around because that's awesome. Right. It feels cool to fly around. So I actually start feeling weightlessness and like like what it would actually feel to fly because your dream is as real as, as you can feel it. Um, so it's super cool. And then I start shooting like fireballs. I start fighting like characters from Mortal Kombat. Like my imagination is crazy. So I'm just doing like the coolest things I can think of before I wake up because I know it's a dream and I'm going to eventually you know, come back to, to real life. So that's the concept of lucid dreaming. And I've been having those like throughout my entire life. Um, and it most commonly happens when I'm having a nightmare and it's really starting to scare me. And one of the ways that I cope with that in the dream is like, no, no, hold on. Is this a dream right now or not? And most of the times, or actually all the times that it, that it does become a nightmare, it is a dream and I'm able to wake myself up from that nightmare instead of continuing um, that horrendous experience. I almost can't believe what you just told me because I've never had anything like that. First of all, I barely, so remember, I barely remember my dreams. Second, <laughs> to be able to identify that you're dreaming within that dream is like, are you awake at this point or are you not? Like, are you kind of, a, it's, it's a state in between conscious and unconscious kind of thing? That's a good question. I've, that's a really good question. It's gotta be, yeah, it's gotta be like a conscious, unconscious 
like relationship where like your unconscious is kind of manifesting the the things that you're seeing or feeling but that conscious thing is still there's still an observer there that's like it realizes it that it's something that, that there's something here experiencing stuff so yeah there is that difference but usually we're not aware that that, that we're there we're just kind of living it for some reason my my experience has always been or a lot of the times has been to just realize that 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 it's fake and that I can manipulate those things what do you think dreams are um depends if you want me to get weird or just try to be normal um weird so absolutely think- be as weird as you can <laughs> <laughs> okay so my my interpretation of what dreams are is kind of like i think a it's a, it's a shared experience amongst all of us so so we all kind of go into the same place let's say when we dream um and from there we're able to kind of um it's kind of like a like a like a computer simulation of what's happening in our lives but in a very metaphorical sense so the dreams that we go into they're kind of like stories that 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 our own unconscious the collective unconscious actually is trying to to tell us something it's trying to like guide us somewhere or teach us something about life or give us some type of uh insight into something now wait 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 a lot on um, wait so you, you, hold on i need to stop you here so you're thinking that we are all connected in the subconscious level in the unconscious level yes oh my god so we are huh it's part of that consciousness field that i that i mentioned to you earlier we're a part of that and so we're all connected into that and that's unconscious that isn't aware like we are right now it's, it's like dark matter or something these bodies that's that's how i've been trying to put it to explain okay. it to people yeah okay keep going sorry um <laughs> No, no worries. These are great. Uh, so yeah, so the dreams have some form of insight, some simulation, computational insight to, to our experiences. But there's there's a caveat there because it really also depends on the person's um, kind of like when we train AI models, right? Garbage in, garbage out. So if you as a person, you're just consuming garbage, right? That's like, you know, social media, um, just just pictures or, or sounds that, that are meaningless, really. Uh, that's going to be part of your subconscious and that's going to manifest itself in your dreams. So when you have your dreams, your dreams are going to be like, I don't know, whatever related to what, what you're listening and, and watching. Uh, but if you're a person that kind of like has more interests and, and likes to like absorb other things, not just uh, junk information, uh, then your dreams are going to also be uh, kind of manifested in a different way in that sense. Um, so it, it's difficult because sometimes people have trash dreams, you know, some people have like weird dreams and like that has no relationship to anything in my life. Um, but it does because it's what you've been consuming. You've been consuming garbage. But what's the role of the unconscious, the, the collective unconscious? Is it, is it trying to tell us something with these dreams? Is there, is there like a message? Is this unconscious has a goal of its own with, with humanity? Like, and then, you know, we can go to the very, it's a very metaphysical arena, but it's really interesting to see your views on that. Yeah, absolutely. I've never really questioned the goal of, of, of the field, let's say, or the unconscious. I kind of just thought or felt that, that its own, that, that its purpose was to, to just be like, like its purpose is to be, um, humans are the people that put judgment into being, right? Um, we, we say that an experience is good or bad, positive, negative. We kind of give that based on our own, our own perception and our own um, beliefs. So to me, the, the unconscious doesn't have a, a desire or it doesn't have like an inclination to, to want to do something. It just is. And, and yeah, and then the, the next layer of reality, when it, when it turns into the subconscious and then conscious uh, beings, that's where we get to decide what the meaning is for that experience that we get to have in that limited amount of time that we live. So let's say a person lives 100 years. 
I get to decide like the meaning for me is going to be to have a family, to get my job, to be a, a professional, et cetera, et cetera. So that's my personal meaning. Uh, it has nothing to do with your meaning. It has nothing to do with my brother's meaning. And it has nothing to do with the unconscious field, which has no real inclination towards doing anything. It just is. That's how I see it, at least. I mean, before you mentioned this, uh, my idea of dreams was that it's a way for the brain to process everything that went through that day and kind of resets and whatever these ideas that come in the dreams, I mean, I don't have any explanation for them. Like, why would it brain produce these images and experiences that feels like reality, but they are just manufactured? It's mind boggling. What's the reason why, why do we dream? You think? I mean, now, now you explained it because it's part of an unconscious, collective unconscious. Are we basically every time yeah. we dream, we are, we are connected to kind of like an internet where we're offloading all the data through this, that's to the I, unconscious. That's yeah, exactly. So one of the big things is like, how does um, conscious experience become unconscious? Like, how do you become? How do you do something without thinking about it? And uh, the answer that I've come to is repetition, conscious repetition. So if I want to learn a new song on the piano, I really have to focus and I really have to know like exactly where my fingers are going to be. I have to really be present and aware. And that takes a lot of energy, a lot of effort. It's not easy. That's why a lot of people don't practice and, and get better at things. But if I do it enough, if I, if, I, if I practice that and I repeat it and I repeat it and I repeat it, eventually, for some reason, it goes into my subconscious or eventually unconscious, let's say. Um, at that point, I don't have to think about it. At that point, I'm doing it, and then my conscious brain can now do something else. Think at another layer of um, experience. So that, I think, is kind of what you're saying, that like we are integrating that into our bodies. But then I, I feel like because the consciousness field is all ever-present, it's also kind of getting integrated into the whole collective field of, of conscious, of our unconscious stuff. So that means that each person is contributing to that unconscious field. So the more, if, let's say we are like better people, like we're, we, we don't have the trash that you were talking about. Uh, then the more like we're contributing positively to that unconscious field. Exactly. To the field. Um, because it also becomes um, like a, for example, I'll, I'll share what I've been doing in my home. So in my home, I've begun talking about this stuff with my with my parents, with my grandparents, um, at a level that they can kind of understand. Because obviously, this is very, very super philosophical and it gets technical. But we've been having these conversations, and and I feel like they've been understanding and they've been also getting involved. And we've been having these these talks about, especially uh, something that we might not be able to touch today, but language. Uh, language to me is the most powerful invention that humans have come up with. And with language, which are just these sounds that, that are created by my, co my vocal cords, they can actually affect you. Uh, we communicated via language to coordinate our meeting today, right? That was possible because of that. Um, bullying, um, you know, saying praise to anybody, um, saying happy birthday, all of these, these forms of sounds and language affect us not only physically, but emotionally and mentally. So in my house, I've been trying to try to say, okay, we're going to use our language in a much better way than we've been previously doing it. So I'll start the conversations. I'll, I'll bring up the topics. We'll start, you know, actually having good productive socialization around the dinner table. Um, so hopefully that uh, starts affecting other unconscious people to begin picking up on that. And hopefully eventually it becomes a larger movement. Um, but I don't think it only can be done unconsciously. It also has to be done uh, consciously, kind of like what we're doing right now, having this conversation out in the open for others to also pick up if they're able to, because not everybody can can appreciate or understand uh, the things that we talk about. And that's why we're, we're seen as weird. Does the consciousness, does your consciousness responsible for your free will? Yeah. Your consciousness is the only place that I've been able to uh, 
um, appreciate where you can argue with yourself, where you can think things through, where um, any subconscious or unconscious ideas or, or whatever pops into your own awareness. And, and you can then, if only if you're aware, can you make a change? Without being aware of something, there is no possibility of changing. And so that's where and my consciousness, right? Um, anytime somebody says something that I might disagree with, I already, uh, it pops up, I feel it. I've been trying to be more aware of like these feelings that I have internally. So somebody says something I disagree with, there's an energy that rises from the bottom, it reaches my head and it starts to go into my, my tongue and wants to say something right away. But I control it, I hold it and I just breathe into it. I experience it. I'm like, this is something interesting that I'm feeling, but I don't need to say it right now. I'll just hold it. So now I'm, I'm choosing more specifically when I want to say things and what I want to say. And that's what I said. Like, it's only possible because of my awareness of that. If I wasn't aware, I wouldn't be able to do this. The reason I ask you this question is because, again, this book, uh, Conscious by Anaka Harris, changed, changed my ideas on a lot of things, including this one. She presented a case that our consciousness is just observing and everything is being done in the brain. And she actually talks about the delay. So things happen, the brain produces outcome and then consciousness kind of become aware of the production of that brain after the fact. And she said that if this was true, it has huge implications because our society is built on the free on the free will on the on the i if if i'm conscious that means i have an i and i'm choosing things and directing things as an i but if the brain is an organ who's producing outcome and my i is simply an observant of that outcome has many implications in terms of like what we do and how we, you know, punish people for crimes and all of that stuff you that know, can go wild. That's very true. That's very true. Um, it, it becomes complicated in those, in those scenarios because I feel that crime is, it's an, it's a, it's a result of, uh, of, uh, in, inequalities and an oppressive system. So I'm not saying that, that criminals don't have a choice. I'm just saying that the environment and the conditions under which they grew up in makes it more uh, more easy for them to to choose um, the bad, right? The crime, the crime lifestyle, uh, because there are little options, little options for them to to you know get a job, find find support with the family members, like I have, like I have my family here supporting me uh, throughout my unemployment. So that's not possible for everybody. So um, they might not have the options available to me, but I do think that they are choosing to do the things that, that they get into. Um, and so that, that also brings up uh, this point of like, yeah, how should we punish them? I, I, I don't think that the correct form of punishment is what we're currently doing, which is just taking them and locking them up into, into you know, rooms forever or for a long time. So yeah, it, it should be that, that part of the system should change. We should uh, change the way that we interact or rehabilitate people um, but at the end of the day, I think we have to decide or, or, or come to, to this conclusion that we're choosing what we want to do. I know our conversation diverts into the human experience, probably the human part of your LinkedIn title, uh, which is also very interesting to me too. Um, and you're also a comedian and creative technologist and an artist at Talk a little bit more about this, and then we can go back to AGI and probably end, end there. For sure. Um, so I've always obviously been super logical, mathematical, technical, love that stuff, love science, love all that. But there's been another part of me that's been more curious, open-minded, um, free-flowing, artistic, weird. And that's kind of something that I've also leaned into. I've, I've accepted that about myself. So... Um, for example, I play the piano, I play the guitar, um, and then I also like to mess around with um, 
for example, the the image generators that that kind of create these very very interesting trippy kaleidoscopic effects. Uh, so I like to produce in interesting visuals. I like to uh, create very complex three D models of like differential equations and like how they form these complex geometries. Um, uh, I, I'm just a creative person in that sense, so that's why I've pivoted from like strictly machine learning and that type of tech stuff more to a creative technologist persona where, where I can use the technology that I've learned and I have experience with, but in a more creative and purposeful manner. Um, and then obviously the comedian part is if there's no humor in your life, it's going to be very difficult to make it through tough spots. So I always take things, um, you know, I, I don't get offended by much. And I try to joke around when there's even sometimes when this might, might be a serious topic, um, but you know, in, in good in good faith, I, I try to elevate the mood a little bit with my humor, um, and, I, and I feel that that's been a great way to bond with others. And and usually, if I feel that the person doesn't understand my sense of humor, um, then it's not a person that I want to really interact with. So it's kind of also like a filter in a sense. Question: uh, Do you memorize jokes, or you are like more instinctual, spontaneous? You make fun of things in the present. That's a good question. So I write, I write my jokes down um, and then I kind of just read them a lot or understand what I'm trying to say, like what I'm trying to get at. And then when I go on stage, I'll just have a, uh, a bullet point about what the joke is about. So that'll remind me what I was reading about and like what I wanted to say. And then I'll kind of say it on stage, but maybe slightly different every time, like improvise a different section here or there. But it's always the same kind of gist. Can you give me your favorite one? <laughs> My favorite joke? Yeah. Um, this one I said, uh, I did a, a show in New York City and I was, I was going through my set and in the, in the middle of it, I was like, you know, guys, I, I support the right to choose. I'm, I'm, I'm really in favor of that. And there was like complete silence. Nobody clapped. Nobody said anything. And I was like, oh, it's just me. Okay, thanks. And then, and then I'm like, you know why? Because... Um, I feel like women have finally deserved the right to choose exactly where they want to go eat, All right? Because every time I'm in a car and I'm like, hey, babe, where do you want to go eat? I don't know. It's like, all right, you finally have a choice. Please, please use your rights. And so that's kind Love of it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very cool. Um, all right. You are opposing the big tech people. Again, I have my notes. I keep referring to them because these are things that I'm curious to ask you and I want to know more about. So, uh, so you don't like big tech. Why? Um, they don't, <clears throat> they don't give a voice to people that disagree with them. That's number one. Uh, number two, they are only interested in profits and I don't, I don't have any confidence in most of the people that are, that are in charge of these big corporations. That's the reason. Got it. What's your definition of AGI? I think it's a, uh, I'm still unsure. I'm, 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 I'll be, I'll be honest. I'm agnostic right now towards the possibility of it. I don't know if it's going to happen or if it's even possible with their, what they're trying to build. Uh, but at the same time, I'm open to the possibility that it could happen somehow, some way. And just to kind of bring this um, into a topic that I'll be talking about on, on a podcast when I also start, uh, it's the history of artificial consciousness and, you know, where these ideas come from. And Homer, the, the guy that wrote the Iliad, he mentions in one of his, uh, in his stories there, um, Hephaestus. He's the blacksmith of the ancient Greeks, so he would be able to forge all these intricate contraptions for them like that's where these these things come from and um supposedly he was already creating a, a, a automata so like automated machines that were considered intelligent that would understand him that would speak to him that would kind of be kind of what we're trying to build today with uh tesla bots and like uh, those robots the human humanoid robots so they kind of would be a, a an army of his that would help him build his stuff so that's that's the myth and aside from that, he was also the person that would build military equipment for the for the other gods. So he would build their shields, their swords, et cetera, et cetera. So he was that guy. He was the guy that produced these things for the gods. And so that kind of reminds me of the people nowadays that are trying to build these systems as well, right? This this 
same thing, these systems that are intelligent, that they can communicate to us, that they can go do our jobs for us, that they can, you know, have that type of interaction. So we're kind of, in a sense, playing Greek gods because we're trying to become like them. Um, but to me, I think the history of it tells us that, that the Greek gods were imperfect. They were not perfect beings. And all of their imperfections are kind of reflected on, on human nature. And we're becoming like them more and more, right, with our technological progress. So eventually we might build those systems. We might build a, a crazy AI that can understand us and they can do this. But maybe that's where our downfall also comes from because we're too uh, proud and we have too much hubris thinking that, that what we're building is just going to benefit us. And it's not going to have its own reasons for wanting to exist or for wanting to be itself or being independent. Um, and then maybe in 4,000 years in the future, people will be reading uh, Lewis's second Iliad where I, where I describe like what we were doing in this moment, point in time, right? Building all these systems. And then they'll look at us as the myth. They'll be like, oh, 4,000 years ago, there were these gods that, that, that were roaming the earth and they could fly in planes and they could do all these magical things, communicate wirelessly, uh, you know, share images across the globe. And people in the future that, that have gone down again in technology or knowledge, they might be like, I don't believe it. It sounds fake. Cool. Do you think, AI, uh, you know, do you think about the implications of this technology on jobs? And do you really believe that it's different than the other technological revolutions that we witnessed where by each technological advancement, people worry about jobs, but then more jobs are created and it's net positive in the end. Do you think this technology, AI, is different from the automobile and the other uh, technological stuff that we've experienced that were beneficial after all. Absolutely. Absolutely. It's, it's, it's literally, like I said, we're, we're trying to achieve a, a godlike state. And if we have that artificial intelligence, that artificial general intelligence, that's the key, the general intelligence part, it'll be able to, to learn any job that gets created, any new job that gets created. Um, it'll be able to learn it better than us, quicker than us, right? Um, and it, it can reproduce itself. It can be in multiple places at once. It doesn't have to sleep. It, it, it's, you know, not biologically limited like we are. Um, so why would we want to hire us, right? When we could just have an AI do the job, create a new job and then clone itself so that it could also do that new job that it just created. So it's completely different than anything we've ever done before because this is an, an infinite automational process where once you automate this AGI to do everything else, nobody else needs to do anything anymore. And so yeah, that'll and really bring about, I think, I'm sorry, go ahead. Combine this with robotics. Now, even the physical labor, you could also um, add AI to a robot and the robot can also do the physical labor stuff. Absolutely. Right now, like you can have a drone, right, flying around, um, doing everything that uh, that a person before would would want to do inside of their farm. So checking, like, like if there's any diseases on the plants, if it if there's any moisture needed in in any area of the farm. Uh, so all those things don't require any more human labor, really. So are and, you and we're probably gonna we're probably gonna cut jobs out quicker than we can replace them. That's also another thing to consider. So you're pessimistic. You don't think that this technology is going to be good for humanity. And that's my current uh, position. I wasn't always like this. I was optimistic a couple years ago. Um, but the more I dove into this world, the more I realized like it's just it's like a movie. It's a dystopian movie that we're we're really part of that. That's that's the reality of life. Um, so instead of um, helping them right with my skills, with my intelligence, with my abilities, um, I'll let them do it. Sure, you guys do it, but I'm going to focus on other things. I'm going to do what I think is my purpose here on Earth. So that's it. But yeah, I mean, that's that's my stand uh, is that, yeah, I mean, maybe this is going to take a lot of jobs and it's going to be difficult, but it eventually, you know, we will figure something out like universal income, perhaps where, you know, people don't have to work, but they can pursue other interesting activities like my personal I love learning and, you know, the, the main reason for the podcast is to learn from people and I love reading and I love, you know, pursuing these intellectual 
growth experiences, perhaps. And I think that I'll be satisfied with that. I, I if there's no, if nothing useful I could do, maybe I'll be useful to myself and to my, to my mind and, and trying to understand, you know, the mysteries of this universe and the mysteries of, of these topics that we delve into. And I think this pursuit, I think AI could help us in this pursuit. And that's why I'm passionate about this technology, because I think that we have a chance to solve mysteries that are hundreds of years old. And today with this technology it is acting as a collective, as a hive mind for us to, to be able to, you know, get it, get it, get ahead or get, move forward in terms of understanding, you know, what the hell's going on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'll say this, uh, people like you give me a lot of hope and you, you reignite my, my desire to possibly look at the good part of this. Um, because yeah, sometimes I can get very pessimistic, um, especially cause like this is, and this is why I need people like you to, to kind of push back on, on my pessimism. Um, so for example, the first computers that we started uh, building, um, they were made for, do you know? The military? Yeah, exactly. They were made specifically for cracking codes during World War II and for calculating where to drop bombs faster than, than our opponents. That's where this comes from. This, this comes from that human desire to kill other people or, or, or just control, let's say, right? Or, or have power over, over others. Um, so if that's the people that are going to end up with this technology, that technology is going to end up in, the, in their hands, right? It's not infeasible to think that once we get AGI, the military is going to put it on a tank or in a plane or in a drone or in all of its army units. And then what? You know, what, what do we do then with, with our, our good intentions and our, and our positivism? Because that's where this technology was birthed from. That's, that's why it was made. And it's probably going to be impossible to not have it go into those systems. So uh, I've okay. been the pessimist, but now I want you to help me get out of that. <laughs> I, I, I will present something for you. And probably after this call, I will share with you one video that allowed me to think positively despite all of this. I agree. Absolutely. Uh, nuclear arm race, right? Like the nuclear race. Soviet Union's United States, all of that stuff. They accumulated uh, in, enough nuclear weapons that will literally put the earth on, on, on fire and boil it, you know, alive with all of the creatures exactly. in it. But then there is this video that I recently watched about game theory. And they basically, it's, 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 it's hard to explain, but they basically designed a competition between a game, uh, you know, a prisoner's dilemma, I believe it's called. Mm -hmm. And, and then they asked everybody to create a strategy to play this game, and they played everything against each other. And then some strategies are good strategies, like, m meaning that they start with being cooperative and nice until somebody else does anything that's something nasty. And then, you know, you design your strategy, whether you want to respond with nastiness or with kindness. And people from like, I think more than 50 or, and they repeated the experiments more than, more than once. But what gives me hope is that every time over a prolonged period of time, like the nice programs always win, always become on top. And then the nicest of them all is something called tit for tat. I would send you that video. It's really interesting. And the tit of tat is saying, okay, I'm going to start with being nice. You, 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 you become nice, we win three points each. But if I'm nice and you, you know, it's like the green and red. Like if, if I if you give you green and you give me red, the next time I'm going to give you red. Mm. Mm. But then the time after, I'm going to go back to being nice because tit for tat. Wow. It's like one tit for one tat. Right. <laughs> and then, you know, this video goes on to say that animals know that too. Animals would um, groom each other based on the same concept. 
is that I need, I need you to, like, if I am an Impala, I need another Impala to groom me from ticks because ticks could kill me. So I need their cooperation and I will happy to pay back. But if, I mean, it's, it's, it's very fascinating world. And this video literally blew my mind, but <laughs> the end product of it, and this could also explain how, you know, even right now, like the, the, they have dismantled so much of the nuclear arsenal, both parties, and they keep each other in check. And even now, despite the war in Ukraine and other wars, we're not seeing the escalation. Um, and I think, you know, there could be a possibility in the future where we understand that being nice is the right thing and being cooperative is the nice thing and is the good thing and is the, uh, is the right thing for mutual winning. And as soon as we realize that as a civilization, there will no need for war anymore. So... Do you think that, that in order for us to realize that, we would need to have the third world war so that we can really appreciate the contrast between what we have right now and what might be after? I mean, it might, but there's also a lot of lessons in history that we could learn from, you know? And uh, I think even, you know, wars these days, they, are, they tax the, the economy and they tax the population and people... And people have a voice, even in dictatorship, believe it or not, even the dictator themselves, they want to keep the people happy because they know that if the people are not happy, they're going to rebel against them. So even with dictatorship, even if they, what seem to be like they don't care about the people, they still do care about the public perception. That's why they have these propaganda machines, because they want to keep the people feeling good. And people are not stupid anymore, you know, and they understood propaganda. The internet has also helped in, in neutralizing, you know, people, even, even, in, uh, even people who live under dictatorship, you know, they don't have to listen to one media channel that talks, uh, that praises the leader, you know, they always have the internet. And even if you block things on the internet, there's always VPN. And this is coming from someone who lived in countries like that. I mean, I work, in countries like Saudi Arabia, um, where there's a lot of websites that are completely blocked. You know, there's people use VPN. They always bypass things because people want to seek truth. And it's innate in us, I believe. So I, I, uh, I hope that I can give you some, some of this optimism. <laughs> It's much appreciated. I definitely need that. Um, I, I always like to keep my pessimism just because um, it, it, it keeps me honest. It keeps me kind of just um, level headed. And if I become too optimistic about this stuff, I might start selling you guys crap. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, of course, you are a gift. Your LinkedIn, by the way, I invite whoever is listening that, you know, your posts are thoughtful, they're thought-provoking, interesting, sometimes funny. Um, so you're doing an amazing job on, on LinkedIn specifically. I, I haven't checked other social channels, and hopefully now this, uh, you know, after all the edits that we do on this podcast, it will be interesting for people to, um, to listen to. And I want to really thank you from the bottom of my heart for being who you are, the, the person, the human that you are, and all the knowledge and wisdom that you have in such a young age. So I appreciate you being here, Louis, and uh, thank you for doing this. Thank you so much, Naja. I appreciate your ability to have conversations, be curious, and yeah, you have your own points of view. So thank you for sharing that and your positivity as well. It's, it's contagious. So Thank you so much. I hope that in the near future, I can also invite you over to possibly converse with me on my show. So I hope that, that, that that's possible. I'd love that, of course. So have a great rest of your Saturday. Thank you, Naja. You too. All right. Bye.